what you need, man. Hi everyone, this is Nick Savides. I wanna get better at connecting with people, so I'm putting together a couple of videos as an experiment. This one is based on my experiences at Dyson House in Baton Rouge on January 4th. I went to go see Lane Mack and Kristen Diablo perform that night. Back in 2016, Lane performed for millions of viewers when he was a contestant on NBC's The Voice. These days, he's shifting his sound towards Americana and Cosmic Country. Not sure what that is, his description, but it sounds out there and compelling and cosmic. He's also gotten to work with accomplished musicians like Robert Randolph, who Rolling Stone included in their list of top 100 guitarists of all time. As it happens, Kristen also had the opportunity to compete on The Voice, but she opted to pursue other music opportunities. Some of her career highlights include performing at Austin City Limits and opening for Lucinda Williams. Her latest album, Create Your Own Mythology, was an album highlighted by American songwriter. It was one of their top 50 albums of the year. Lane and Kristen have both played at South by Southwest and Jazz Fest, and I imagine a few other shared festivals as well. But Dyson House was the first time they shared the stage together, at least on the same day or night. That wasn't the only thing they have in common. Lane and Kristen both seem to have a penchant or hats. At least that night, Lane wore the white hat. Kristen wore the black one. I learned that wasn't something they planned. It just sort of happened. Now, if this were a classic Western, then that would have special significance. <laughs> but it's not. So it's just a fun fact, or is it? Well, I don't think it has special significance, but you can never really be sure about these things, right? It would be nice if there was a hotline or something that we could call to get clarification. Hi, yes, I'm calling about the hats worn by Lane Mack and Kristen Diablo. Mm-hmm. January 4th, uh-huh, uh-huh, completely random, no, no significance at all, well, that, that makes sense, okay, well, thank, uh, wait, say that again, the polka dotted parka worn by Baxter Baggins, that has supreme significance, it contains clues to the mysteries of my very existence. Uh, I don't know any Baxter Baggins. Are you sure about that? Uh-huh. Oh, uh, no, no, you, you don't need to get your supervisor on to double check. That's fine. That's nice of you to offer, though. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe some other time I'm, I'm in the midst of doing a video here, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye out for someone named Baxter Beckins and polka dotted parkas, okay? Yep, thank you very much. Bye now. Well, where were we? The show at Dyson House. I'd been to the old location for the Dyson House listening room on Jefferson, but not to the new location, Zeeland Street Market. So this was a chance to go check that out and also meet Lane and Kristen in person. I had done the interviews with both of them on my podcast a while back, different times, different shows, but we had done those over Skype. So this would be a chance to meet them in person. That was intriguing to me, but... I couldn't find anyone to come along. So I'd end up going alone if I went. 
And I've done that before. I did that in episode two of this connection experiment. Went to Vons in New Orleans. And um, that didn't go as expected. There was some dissonance there, in part because there was a lot of dancing and it was unsettling to me. Would this be the same? I wasn't sure. There was another factor involved as well, something to which Lane alluded in his comments at the show. It seems like everybody's gotten so damn busy that they just don't have time for fun things anymore. Like so many others, I have a to-do list that just seems to keep growing and growing. Could I justify going to see live music with so many things that I have to do? Besides, attending would end up costing more than a movie ticket, which may have been one reason why others weren't interested. Wouldn't it be easier and more affordable to just go see a movie with a friend? Why go see live music by myself when there were so many other things to do? What was so special about live music anyway? These are some of the things that were in the back of my mind as I was thinking about going. Questions I asked myself. And yet, it still felt like I should go for some reason. The deciding factor may have been that Kristen had recorded her latest album, Create Your Own Mythology, in Nashville. And the last Connection Experiment video I released was set in Nashville, based on my experiences there, the Nashville Film Festival. The place made enough of an impression that it was still something that was positive enough to make me want to go. Maybe there was a connection here as well. And so I went. When I got to Zeeland Street Market, I noticed the place had personality. Eclectic decorations, signs, and music posters were scattered across the walls. It was a full house and people were sitting, listening to music, not dancing. Well, there was some dancing, at least from the performers on stage, but there wasn't any social pressure for those of us in the audience to get up and dance. And for me, that was a big plus. While waiting in line to get tickets for the show, I met Maria and Chris in line. They told me that they enjoyed seeing live music on occasion and were grateful for the chance to attend that night. We developed some rapport, enough that John Burns, the executive director of Dyson House, thought we were friends by the time that I was in line and, and there to get tickets, and he sat me with them during the show. So that was nice. I built some rapport with someone I knew a little bit and we had that going into the show. Also seated at our table was Randolph Thomas who I met that night as well. Hey. I learned that he's also a musician who's played at various venues around town. So that was a fortuitous or serendipitous connection. Lane Mack played first, and one of the notable songs he sung was It Must Have Been Rain, a song that he wrote a couple years ago. I had a decent view of the stage, so I'll share some of the footage I got of the performances in a moment. But my primary focus that night wasn't to create a compelling music video. It was to aim for connection. The footage I got was limited as a result. Still, I thought it would be fun, it would be an interesting challenge to play with the footage I got and try to do something stylized with it. More about that in a moment. New life. And it tears me up inside. My take on the song is that it's about a relationship gone awry. As I look into your eyes, 
seems like the song starts right around when that instinct to pretend like everything is fine kicks in. And yet there are the little moments that suggest otherwise. The averted gaze. The runaway tears. The little moments of truth that seep in and get past the facade. And then there's that struggle to maintain composure, play it cool, act like nothing happened, no big deal, it's a-okay. Except for the moments when it isn't, when someone sees otherwise. Oh, you thought you saw something. Well, must have been the rain. That's all. Just the rain. That's what you saw. I don't know if we can make it. In researching the song, I discovered that Lane had once recorded that song with Julie Williams for a music video release. Get it, Lane, get it. Lane actually used the music video release of the song to try to help a fellow musician and her daughter. Chrissy Fortin and Lou, they lost their house because it burned down and he did an outreach about that, trying to help them get some money to rebuild. Here's what he wrote on his Facebook page about that incident. Before I put this new song out, I was thinking it could be cool to use it for something good in the world. I thought of St. Jude's or other charities similar to that, and then the fire happened, and I couldn't think of a better thing than helping someone in my own community. He then donated some of the proceeds from the song and linked to a GoFundMe page where others could donate as well. It was neat to see Elaine use a song about private hidden pain to address and to help someone facing very public, out in the open pain of a house burning down. This is a series about connection, so I look for those kinds of pairings or polar opposites. But nonetheless, it had an impact. I can be a little cynical sometimes about the entertainment industry because some of the things I've seen or experienced, haven't we all, right? But this felt earnest. I'm not a musician, so I don't know exactly what that's like trying to make it work day by day. But I have spent years of my life 
trying to build a sustainable career in the entertainment industry, specifically for video production. And sometimes that can feel like an all-consuming task. And when I get caught up in the midst of it, sometimes I lose track of the aches and the struggles and suffering that others are facing just trying to make it work with whatever they're doing. That's a mistake. I don't want to be that person. I want to care. I'm trying to get past that. But it remains a challenge for me and possibly for many of you out there. All that to say, it's helpful to me, affirming to me, to see someone like Lane talk about wanting one of his songs to do something good in the world. It's an admirable outlook. And sometimes just having that desire, that intention can make a difference. To say, well, this is what I'm aiming for. Let's try to align to that aim. Seeing Lane do as much was inspiring to me and made me want to do as much in my own way. I even prayed while putting together this video that something good could come of it. Lane concluded his set with the song Everything, which acknowledges that sometimes all we need is a good relationship with the right person. And that's enough to help us get by. May not have everything. We got everything we need, yeah. We may not have everything. But we got everything we need. Thank you so much for having me. After Lane's set concluded, I caught up with him afterwards to do a quick interview. I started by asking him about his reaction to the venue. Yeah, this venue's great, man. You know, I don't get to do a lot of listening room where people are calm. <laughs> They're always dancing, party, and that kind of stuff, getting rowdy, and usually full band shows, but this, by myself, solo, they get to hear the songs just like I wrote them. Then I asked him what he's learned as a musician about connecting with others. Wow, oh, man, I mean, being in the music business is probably your best, uh, your best bet if you want to connect with people, because that's, that's literally 99% of what we do, you know? We got 1% writing music and taking care of that stuff, but you're always, you're even in that, you're meeting songwriters, you know? You're meeting, you're meeting audience members, you're meeting all walks of life, and you're playing with, hopefully, if you're a good musician and you, you spread yourself out, you're playing with all walks of life, uh, different musicians, you know? So it is connecting, and I think music also is the gap, you know? It bridges the gap. It, it is what connects people to one another. What tips do you have for those of us who aren't cool rock stars and still want to try to connect? I think it's, uh, I mean, look, the, the biggest thing about connecting is finding that common ground, right? And uh, I think everybody, uh, kind of from traveling and having that experience in life, I think everybody has a little bit of common ground. And, and I think if you, can, if you can find that with somebody else, even a stranger, I think you'll be able to connect pretty good. All right, that was Lane Mack, everyone. Thanks for talking to us, man. Yeah, man, you yeah. got it. Check the links below for details about Lane's music and also the podcast interview I did with him back in the day. Kristen was up next. As she was getting set on stage, she was talking to the soundboard operator about getting more of the microphone in the mix. Can I get just a little bit more of this, uh, this 
thing right here, this microphone. That momentary search for the right word could have been something she ignored, but she made a moment of it. Your, your words don't work anymore? <laughs> I mean, like, microphone. That was just like a does not compute for me. <laughs> and I'm wondering when that changes. I'm trying to make sounds to check this, but I've realized that the sounds I now make are baby sounds. <laughs> and that... That's kind of embarrassing on a stage, I guess. It's like, boo boo doo boo doo 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 no. <laughs> It's like your brain converts to baby speak when you're with your little baby all the time. I like baby speak. I, I think she gets me. <laughs> she showed us that she's not just a polished performer, but she's someone on stage being honest, sharing some of her struggles with us. And that was endearing. In the spirit of Kristen's microphone moment, I want to add that I wish I had gotten audio directly from the soundboard that night. It's what I would have done if I was covering the event professionally, but that wasn't my focus that night. Just trying to connect with people is challenging enough, so I try not to add other factors that could also influence that. The more equipment that I bring to a video shoot, the more time it takes for setup, teardown, and so on, and the more I'm thinking about where I'm gonna place the equipment. Plus, the more equipment I bring, the more people notice, and then expectations might increase as a result. People start thinking, what are you going to do with all this equipment? Are you going to make something worthwhile? And those are perfectly valid questions on a professional shoot. But for something where it's less clear what's going to happen, when there's uncertainty, I'm calling this the connection experiment for a reason, after all. That can be a deal breaker. So I'm trying to minimize those things going in. There's also something else. When I go to these shoots, I also don't want to be someone where the crew, specifically the sound crew at the venue, is thinking, oh, look at that guy. Which is just a completely irrational fear, right? Like, what are they going to say? Oh, look at this guy bringing all this extra equipment. Like, he's trying to be professional. Generally speaking, the sound professionals I've met at various events have been quite friendly to me. And yet, I still have this fear that my encounter with one of them will go kind of, sort of, like this. Excuse me, I need to connect the recorder over, over there. Uh, I'm doing a little video thing with this guy. Mm. Uh, this one. Mm -hmm. What? I was in the midst of setting the levels and you interrupted the automation process, mother uh. Now you've done it. You've turned it into a fully armed and operational mother battle station. That doesn't even make sense. It's a soundboard. An operational battle station, motherfucker. You just initiated the, the irreversible self destruct sequence. It's just a freaking soundboard, man. Come on. Turn it off. Unplug it. And that's why I'm hesitant to approach the sound guys. What can I say, I'm easily amused. But that segment took a more dramatic turn than intended. I thought about not including it, but it does feel like it relates to the discussion about connection. And that's because sometimes the connection challenges aren't just a matter of saying the right line finding a reason to approach, to start the conversation. There's a part of that. There's also psychological things, insecurities, past experiences that influence. 
But I do think sometimes the connection challenge is a spiritual issue. From my limited perspective, it seems like people are these complicated mixes of light and dark, good and evil. And I'm including myself in that as well. In case it wasn't insanely obvious, I was playing the part of the demented soundboard operator. That's not the way I try to live, but I have felt that rage, that pressure, that darkness from others, sometimes more so in the entertainment industry. But it's also something that I wrestle with in various shades as well. Even in putting together this video, I was oscillating between trying to have some fun with something, reacting to things, or, or being honest, aiming for something good. And it is something I'm aiming for. As I mentioned before, I was moved by Lane wanting something good to come of his song. And that is a real aim for me here as well. It's just a matter of trying to get out of the way and figuring out what that looks like. Sometimes it's messy because we're messy. And so rather than try to present the struggle in a more polished way, I'll leave the complexity, the messiness, in the video and you can draw your own conclusions. This is the the part that I'm recording after I've recorded everything else. So now let's get back to the rest of what I recorded. To all you nice sound people who have worked with me throughout the years, I uh, um, just trying to get the heart right, okay? I appreciate you. Oh, all right. I just, I just hearts. I think. Uh. I was trying to make a point, though. Right, the inverse relationship between the amount of gear I bring and my inclination to connect with others. Here's the thing: the more gear I bring to an event, the more I associate that with job mode, trying to be professional. And I had this thing early on when I was just getting started with my career, where I would try not to be personable because it was something that was a challenge for me. Opening up, connecting with people was challenging. So I thought, you know, I just want to be professional. I don't want to bring that uncertainty into the job. As a result, sometimes I feel like in my past professional endeavors, I came off as being a little too mechanical. And it wasn't that I didn't care about people. It was just that I thought, all right, this could go badly. I might not connect. Maybe I should just keep a distance just to be safe. I hope I can someday get to the point where I take aiming for a connection as a given. But I'm not there yet. It's still something that's a little stressful to me. And so I'm trying to do whatever I can to make it a little easier. If that means bringing a little bit less gear to these connection experiment videos, then so be it. Sometimes the priority of a project is capturing the best footage possible. I've shot projects like that. I've shot music videos, commercials, short films, and the like, 
where that was the focus. You can see some of the videos I've shot in that style over at ncivides.com. But in this case, for this video series, connection is the emphasis. Next time though, if there is a next time for this video series, I will bring along a sound recorder so that I can patch into the soundboard and possibly get some cleaner audio for you all. And it'll give me a chance to practice my banter with our nice sound crew technicians. Back to the show at Dyson House. After Kristen played a couple songs for us, she told us that she was initially from Baton Rouge, where she was born, but she ended up in New York in pursuit of her music career. Incidentally, I was born in New York, but I ended up in Baton Rouge in pursuit of a film career. So we have that connection of sorts. Anyway, Kristen told us about one of the songs she first wrote in New York. It's called Lines on the Road, and she played it for us. Kristen ended the night with Honey Leave the Light On, one of my favorite tracks from her album, Create Your Own Mythology. Honey, leave your light on As is far as I can see What a road that leads you far away When you break even to leave So After the show, Mariah and Chris told me they enjoyed the music, and we talked about the possibility of going to see more live music together. Then I talked to Randolph about Kristen's set, was curious to hear what he would say as a fellow musician. I loved her voice, and I loved her songs, and, and she had a great band. The whole thing was just fantastic. Randolph mentioned that he had an upcoming show at La Divina, but I wouldn't be able to make it. I would be coming back from California that day and didn't get back in time. But I hope that I'll get to catch Randolph's show one of these days. While waiting for a chance to talk to Kristen, I got to talk to John Burns, the executive director of Dyson House. It's been a great move for us to move from Jefferson Highway to Zealand Street Market. It's been a good marriage, not a partnership, but um, I never thought it would be as good or better as the old place, but it's way better. We've had uh, 63 shows since April, and uh, you know, I'm just real pleased to be here. I complimented the music lineup that he's brought to Dyson House and then asked him about how he connects with the bands he brings in. A lot of musicians reach out to me asking me if they can come play. Uh, a lot of times the bands I've never heard of, but I listen to every single one of them and if it seems like something I think I can sell, I bring them in. I think we're doing the right thing and musicians want to play here. Stephanie Ferris, the owner of Zealand Street Market, 
And the queen of soul food, according to 225 Magazine, saw me shooting footage and came up and said hello. Hello everyone, I'm Stephanie at Daisy Street and we'd like you to come visit us soon at Dyson House. It's neat getting to meet the owner of a place. It gives the venue more personality and I'm more likely to go back when I have that sense of connection. So sometimes connection does have its rewards Although, we shouldn't try to connect with people just because we're trying to get something from them. Rather, connection should be an end to itself because people are inherently worthwhile and interesting. And for me, when I'm connecting with others, I feel more like a person. I feel like that's inherent to being a person. I was glad that Stephanie came up and said hello, so I asked her for a recommendation about what to try on my next visit. The most favorite dish is uh, Mama's Pot Rose. It was created by my grandmother, Rachel. It's been in the family about 100 years now, and uh, it comes with mashed potatoes, green beans, and a salad, and cornbread. A couple of weeks later, I did make it back to Zealand Street Market. On Valentine's Day of all days, I happened to be in the area, so I thought I'd give the pot roast a try. It was quite a hearty meal, and Stephanie was nice enough to take a photo with me to commemorate the event. After talking with Stephanie that night at Dyson House, I had some time to observe Kristen interacting with fans. She's really great at connecting, one of the better musicians I've seen doing it listening attentively, offering a friendly smile to those nearby, really compelling. Finally, it was my turn to say hello to Kristen. How's it going? I told her that the video series I'm doing is on connection and then complimented the way that she was connecting with people that night. You are so incredible at it. Oh, yeah? You had a great rapport with the audience, with the band. Tell us your take on connection. Yeah, I, I, I feel like songs for me are kind of like my first language. So, like a conversation or just regular vocabulary or social, like conditioning and regular social interactions are okay. But the way the universe sort of makes sense to me the most is through a song. And it's not just the words, it's not just the music, it's kind of a combination of both. And I feel like it kind of, music has the ability to kind of transport us to some more universal place. Yeah. Connection beyond language and beyond social protocols. And, and that's kind of, that's why I love music so much. And that's why I write songs. And when we get to play shows like this, it's always a real great joyous night because we get to just be in flow with the songs and what, what we connect to with. As I was asking Kristen for tips on how to connect with others, they turned the lights off at the venue. But Kristen stayed focused on our conversation. Here's what she said. I find that I feel the most connected no problem, when I'm not trying. And you just kind of get out of your head and be in the moment and be present and, and be in the flow of what's, what's happening and where you're at and the people you're with and not be thinking and just being. That's kind of when everything connects the most and it seems, it just feels effortless. It's quite a skill to remain so attentive, even when circumstances aren't ideal. And Kristen made it look so easy. Thanks for taking the time to connect with me, Kristen. So that was what happened when I visited Dyson House that night. In thinking about my experiences and some of the questions I had about going, I realized something. Going to see live music is something I do looking for connection. It's a little different than going to the movies in that regard. I might go see a movie with friends or by myself, but I'm not looking for connection necessarily. 
just want to go and experience a compelling story. With live music, it's a little different. If I don't feel a sense of connection with the performer or the audience, I'm going to feel disappointed, like I didn't get my money's worth. So in that regard, it is a little different. That night, I felt more of a connection because both Lane and Kristen opened up about some of the things that they're facing. Instead of presenting the polished versions of themselves, they showed us some of the struggles. My life isn't exactly like theirs, but I could relate. And that was somehow reassuring. You may have spotted the Jazz Fest poster at Dyson House. Stephanie was standing next to it. It does have significance here in Louisiana. So I'll add this note. A few days after the Dyson House performance, the Jazz Fest lineup was announced. Lane Mack is playing on April 25th. Kristen is playing on April 23rd. It would be the 23rd, wouldn't it? It's a number that keeps showing up. There's an ongoing streak of it showing up on my podcast. And now even for these connection experiment videos, I should add that I initially posted my podcast interview with Kristen back on June 23rd, 2015. And with Lane, it was September 23rd. 2017. So the number goes back a ways. And it's usually showing up in ways that are beyond my control. It's not just me choosing when to post the podcast. It shows up in other ways as well. It keeps showing up for whatever reason. I won't bore you with all of my thoughts about numerology. Not yet. It's quite a trip down the rabbit hole. But let me just give one example. I recently learned that John Coltrane was born on September 23rd, which I noticed in part because it was the same day when I posted the interview for Lane. Not because I sought out the number, but because I watched a documentary, Chasing Train, on Netflix that was on my home screen. It just felt like something I should check out. And uh, there it was again, relating in some strange way or not to this video. Might all be just a coincidence, but this is a show about connection. So I'm open to the possibility that things are interconnected even more than we can possibly imagine. This video marks the fifth connection experiment video I've done. And from the beginning, I committed to doing at least five. So technically, this one could be the last one. Although the Christmas one feels a little different, in part because of the way it came together. It's also the one video in the series that doesn't seem to have a connection to the number 23. So I might do at least one more connection experiment video. After that, we'll see. Your feedback might make a difference. If this is helpful, leave a comment or like, and that'll be a factor. It's been an interesting experiment in that I push myself to get a little bit out of my comfort zone. And I did get to connect with people. But these videos take time to do. And a part of me wants to focus on doing more high quality videos, fleshed out concepts, and so on. Instead of doing a concept where I'm putting the emphasis on connection, on doing something that is still a challenge for me. So we'll see. But there is that one remaining video. I've shot some of it, in fact. It's about what happened when I went to California recently. And that one is just a tad 
more dramatic than this one. But it's also more overwhelming. I've had several weeks to try to process it all, and I still don't know how to put it to words or make sense of it. But it feels like maybe it's something I'm supposed to address for whatever reason. It's just that I'd prefer not to. It's easier not to. For a while, this episode was the buffer. I knew in the back of my head, I don't have to worry about that one because I haven't released this one. And if I don't release this one, I won't have to do that one. But sometimes we have to face those things. There's something else that I've been putting off as well. This video was helping me to do that. To quote Fight Tess, the song from the Flaming Lips, there are things you can't avoid. You have to face them when you're not prepared to face them. So, maybe I will at some point down the road at an indefinite point far, far away. Or soon-ish, we shall see. We shall see. But in the meantime, I should probably conclude this video, right? When I do coverage at events, whether for a video or a podcast or what have you, there's this temptation to make the event grander than it is, so as to justify the time spent attending. I don't want to do that here. I'm not going to suggest that while I was there, the heavens opened, and I understood my purpose in this world more so than ever. My connection challenges melted away, and it was pure harmony. But I did see talented musicians perform, and I heard them share openly, honestly, about some of their struggles. In doing so, I felt a little less alone. I did feel a sense of connection that took my mind off some vexing aches and dilemmas, at least for a little bit. That left me feeling a little bit more hopeful. And for that, I'm grateful. Music, like anything, can have a good or bad influence on us. But because I attended the show at Dyson House, I discovered that Lane had intended for one of his songs to do some good in the world. And as a result, he was able to help a fellow musician in need. That was inspiring. So was the way that Kristen interacted with everyone in such an open-hearted way. And the way that she sang about keeping the light on and asked in her concluding song whether rock and roll could save a person's soul. Sometimes it can. I don't see why not. The show was an inspiration and I'm glad I attended. Check the links below for more on upcoming shows at Dyson House, music from Lane and Kristen, and my prior podcast interviews with them. If I can get out there and connect with others, you can too, so get to it. Let's make the world better one connection at a time.